also the author <laughs> of uh, States of Obligation, Citizenship and Taxation in Imperial and Early Soviet Russia, published by Toronto in 2014, a really fascinating book. Uh, it's got all sorts of prizes, Wallace Ferguson Book Prize, Canadian Historical Association, Ed Hewitt Book Prize, Political Economy, ACES, honorable mention also from uh, ACES and Davis Center. So, Yanni. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, simply by the fact that you're, we're hosting you, I'm, the, I'm your president. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm Muslim, of course. <laughs> Um, uh, I wanted to thank Susan, who's actually made this into a real conference. Uh, Susan and the entire board. Uh, but I think we would all agree that Susan does the bulk of the work right in this, uh, this past year, and she does a very good job. Uh, we hope that you'll continue to come to the Jordan Center. You're always welcome. Uh, it's a good location. Uptown, the air pressure is a little too low. Where do you want to stay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <ouch>. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm a graduate, so I can say this with, with fondness. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, um, um, a keynote. So keynotes are usually you, you've gone through your morning sessions, you're, you've probably traveled, you may be tired, you've just eaten and you want to take a nap, right? <laughs> so, um, so the usual keynote uh, would be that I give you something with gravitas, right? And something about our field or something about... But I want to talk about actually something that I usually talk about at dinner meetings with colleagues, right? And so as the wine begins to flow, we all tell our war stories about what it was like to research in Russia, or in, my, in those days it was the Soviet Union, when I began to research there. And these are stories that we tell for entertainment value, and we laugh and all that. Um, but actually, the entertainment value is partly because these, these, these stories are interesting. I mean, anecdotes about the, that we experience, they won't make it into the CV, right? And they won't make it into our, our book because it's not scholarly enough. Um, but but I've, and it's true, it's not, it's not scholarly in that sense. Uh, but it is instructive, right? And we learn a lot from, from these stories. And the reason why we're entertained by them when we laugh over dinner is precisely because um, there's something to it that's more than just the joke, right? And it's more than just the, um, uh, the, the laugh out loud quality to, to these stories. So I thought as a combination of entertainment um, and actually what it is to be um, a scholar of Russia, uh, to take the conversation in that direction. So what I'd ask you to do is not take notes, um, <laughs> sit back, um, um, uh, be entertained. And, and in particular, um, if you want to comment during or after, uh, you don't need to pose scholarly questions, just rejoin, you know, disagree, have a conversation, that kind of thing. Uh, and we'll see if this works. Uh, what I have for you then, um, I actually have a total of about six anecdotes, you know, choice anecdotes, things that I experienced in my travels to Russia, all of which were failures in different ways. And they were failures because they, uh, they betrayed my own misunderstandings, my own ignorance, and sometimes my over, overly professional and overly educated attitude. Meaning because I was trained in certain ways, uh, I couldn't see things for what they were. Or, or at least I missed dimensions which were equally interesting, not more interesting than scholarship, but I missed them precisely because I'm well trained. And so uh, a good education, in other words, can have very poor results. I have three in mind in particular, but if there's extra time, or if by popular acclaim you want to hear more, I'll give you a couple more after that. Um, and I'll try to keep myself to about 40 minutes, we're about, Susan, should we say? Yeah. Uh, before I do that, uh, thanks to Heather and Natasha. Heather is the uh, the director of uh, the Jordan, sorry, the uh, administrator of the Jordan Center. <laughs> she deserves she deserves a better title. Uh, we're going to work on it. And then, NYU, the, if you want to make someone sound really exalted, then you call them global something. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I would call you the global administrator. Of <laughs> All right. So anecdotes, anecdotes. So my first one, uh, this idea actually came from one of my graduate students, um, uh, Katie David, who's also on the board of ACES. When I was sitting down with her, I said, what on earth am I going to talk about for a keynote? She said, why don't you talk about Babushka and the sewing machine, right? Which I'd spoken about with some of my students. It was in a class, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I said, actually, that was pretty instructive. So it goes like this. It's somewhere around the winter of 1991. Actually, I can tell you, it was right around the time of March 1991. So it's still winter in Russia. Um, uh, uh, and it was around the time of the referendum about whether the Soviet Union should exist. Do you remember the, the referendum? I think it was like March 17th or something like that. And I found myself on these travels, um, I had taken the train from Moscow, right? I headed up north, got off at Vologda. In Vologda, I was doing my research in the archives. It's a wonderful place to visit if you haven't been already. From there, I took, I, the best I can describe it is like a bush plane, and went to Vilyuzhuk, which is over here, right, in, in that direction. Uh, meaning I'm almost at the Urals. Uh, I'm an old believer country, for the most part. Uh, Likhachov's great contribution was that he saved that city from development and destruction. Um, it's well worth a visit because there's so much of the, of the downtown has been preserved. There it is right there. 
Such a temptation idea. Um, um, and it's at the intersection of the Sukhana and the um, Henry which other river. Um, so it's, it's well worth a visit. But from there, we didn't stop there. We did the tours and we took some pictures. But then the person who was guiding me took me and he said, let's go visit uh, what he called the Lubinka. Yeah. He said, let's go to some real countryside that you haven't seen before. So from there, we took a, a, another bush plane and we went to a little town called Kichminski Garadok. Has anyone heard of Kichminski Garadok? Good, good, good. Then I'm setting this up nicely. Um, from Kichminski Garadok, where we drank with the local party leaders, uh, like full bottles of vodka, um, and I was sort of uh, a little woozy, we got onto a bus. And on the bus, we traveled along this road, which was, I don't know if it was asphalt, because it was frozen, because you're, you're driving on snow and ice, basically. And we drove for another, what, 40 minutes, an hour, or something like that, got off in the middle of what I thought was nowhere, and he said, come on, let's go. Home is that way. So we started walking through the snow, uh, through this path that had been cleared, again, but it's still snow, there's no asphalt, I don't know what we're walking on. We arrived finally, I didn't know we arrived until we actually got there because the entire village is under snow. And what they had was work brigades which would come out and dig these canals between the houses leading to the central square, if there is one, there was a central area, so that when you're walking through it, the snow is up to here and you don't know what's going on around you. It's just a fascinating experience. So he took me to his mother's house. His mother lived in a good old fashioned log cabin. Right, uh, izba, right, exactly as they described, which is to say, half of the house is given over to the animals. The animals give you heat during the winter, the, the heat rises. Other things rise too, but let's keep it to the heat. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's partitioned here, so the living quarters are on this side of the izba. And we sat down, I looked around. Um, um, I, I, I actually had read enough so that I put my ear against the, uh, the logs and I could hear the sh 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 the crack, um, which was the cockroaches, right? So, so for the house to be well insulated, you put cockroaches in to make sure if the cockroaches survive winter, then your house is well insulated. So this became a superstition. So a lot of the old izbas actually do have the cockroaches still in the walls. They live off of the bark for the most part. Fascinating experience. I looked around the world. <laughs> so cockroaches have different meanings. These are not New Yorkers, right? <laughs> but cockroaches are good, right? They're signs of life, right? So, um, so I looked around, and in one corner there was the um, uh, there was the, the the red corner, which is to say the icons. Um, so these were not old believers; these were Orthodox. Um, um, uh, you know, Church of uh, the Ch Church of Russia, and so, and th 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 there was that, and then along the walls there was like Lenin and Brezhnev for, for you know printouts, and so I, I asked the usual questions because I'm inquisitive and because I was uh, God knows how, how young I was, and I was nerdy. So I said, oh, and you know, so I understood the religious parts, and I said, well, what about Brezhnev? Why is Brezhnev there? And she looked at me and says, oh, because with Brezhnev we got Pramtavadi right for the first time, which is to, and we got bread, and I said, what do you mean you didn't have bread before? Well, we had bread, but because we don't grow anything here, we never knew when to get the grains. Thanks to Brezhnev, the plane loads up every day with freshly baked bread, which is still warm, flies into the village and gives them their bread. So every single day. That was the Soviet system. And it, that was, I found it remarkable. Um, and I said, and Lenin is there. Why is Lenin there? He says, oh, well, with Lenin, we didn't know, before Lenin, we didn't know how to read. And I said, yeah, but, oh, there's a picture of Lenin with a book, you know, sitting down with a light coming down. So electricity. We got electricity from Lenin. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So, of course, I'm making mental notes. I'm actually probably writing things down, which is probably the stupid thing I could have done, because, because I should have just been enjoying the moment and experiencing the moment. Um, uh, but as I said, I was, I was being trained as an academic. <laughs> <laughs> and as I was proceeding, um, um, uh, I, I also noticed... Um, uh, other things, like she was, she had the, the oven, but the entire household was focused around the oven. It was always kept going, and once in a while she'd throw in a log. Uh, she, brought out, uh, she brought out a lamb which she had cooked in there. She had actually caught the lamb herself, slaughtered it, stripped it. And I mean, it, it, then she asked me to help her pitch the hay when I was completely incapable because I didn't understand the pivoting, right? I, I didn't grow up in a hay society, right? <laughs> so, um, so, so I didn't know how to pivot. So finally she says, you know, just get out, move us. She did it herself. Right? She did it herself. She's 80-something, right? She's still doing this. The one of the reasons why she's doing it is because there's no labor force left. Everyone's gone, right? So be it. And then I said, because I was nerdy and because I was leading, I, I, I'm already setting up the wrong atmosphere uh, for her, because in my questions, and this is the basic anthropological problem, in my questions I was giving her answers and directing her. So because I was studying agricultural history, and I said, Mbabushka, tell me something, um, uh, how was collectivization here? Right? Now, I know, it's, it's really a dumb thing to have asked, right? but I did, because that's what the books told me. Periodization, 1917, new economic policy, collectivization, great rupture, all the land is taken. She looked at me, she says, what? Collectivization. She says, no idea what I'm talking about. And I said, well, 
Okay, you should understand. This is not an agricultural district, it's animal husbandry. <laughs> there was no land to seize. Right? There was pasture, but that was just changed the name. It was the, the common pasture land, and now it became uh, part of what they called a collective farm. Imeni, uh, uh, probably Gedrof or something like that. Um, uh, so that was the first problem, which she, she had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, the second problem was that I was just assuming, because the stereography had taught me so clearly that this is a periodization, I was imposing the periodization on her. She had no idea what, what, what these points of reference were. Her son then turned to her and shouted because she was a little deaf. She says, she said, Mama, it's when they took the sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> she says, ah! <laughs> She completely understood. She completely understood. And she started talking, and she gave me an entirely different story. The periodization was more or less right, but we're probably in the early 1930s, right? It's not the late 1920s, the early 1930s. She couldn't quite remember. But she described it. She said, um, the Fin Inspectory came, which is the tax collectors, and they took all of her valuables, including the Samavad, but especially the sewing machine. Now, why these things? Because they can be sold easily, right? They're easily marketable, right? They're, easily, they're, they're worth something, in other words. Um, so I said, well, so what's this about the sewing machine? She says, well, you know, we couldn't pay our taxes because that's what collectivization, what we call collectivization was a process of stripping the, the peasants of their, of, their, of their valuables, right, to use them to melt down and whatnot, right, or to redistribute as the case may be. So I said, so, so what, and, and as she, be, she spoke to me, I began to see a different world, which I wasn't equipped to ask about. I had little bits of information here and there. I'd read Beatrice Farnsworth, who wrote very much about what it is to be a peasant woman in particular. Um, I'd read some of these things, so I had enough information to begin to make sense and to realize that I'd asked the wrong question as she began to explain to me a different story. And her story went like this. Um, uh, she was a woman in a peasant household, right, um, uh, with a low sense of self-esteem. Right. I, I mean, she doesn't control the land. She doesn't participate in politics. As Soviet power notwithstanding, she didn't have a lot uh, that was really considered to be hers. Um, but the sewing machine changed her life. Or the sewing machine changed her life. It was, first of all, her dowry. Right. And the dowry, you understand in this context, is not simply uh, a bride's price. Right. A dowry in this context is the one thing that belongs to the woman and not to the man, you see. Um, so by taking that away, they were taking away her, her, her sense of autonomy uh, and her sense of empowerment and enablement uh, and her sense of value also, number one. Uh, number two, uh, the sewing machine wasn't simply an economic proposition. Uh, already that should be clear. But the sewing machine for her was actually uh, how she was useful to the people around her. to give her a sense of self-worth. She made clothing. This is before manufactured clothing. This is before um, uh, the factory produced the clothing for you. She would make clothing. She would mend things for other people. She would do it for her family. That's how she expressed her love and her affection to the rest of her family. By taking away the sewing machine, in other words, uh, they, they took away her sense of self-worth and her, her sense of value. That was what happened to her. Right? Collectivization doesn't capture it. Right? Um, statistical tables about, um, about what was taken, a land, and it, it doesn't begin to capture it. Right? This was a real human story, um, um, and, and actually in some ways a much more real story. And it taught me um, that our periodizations, that we use as historians, um, exist mainly for convenience, right? uh, but they don't have an intrinsic value. Uh, I would say the same thing about the Russian Revolution. It's a convenience, but we don't know what it means when we look at that to date, you know, 1917, 1929, um, 1936, as the case may be. It was a lesson for me. It was a lesson for me. As we were leaving, as we were leaving, two things happened. Um, first of all, she came out into the main square, the main cleared area. I still don't know if it was a square because it was all covered in snow, but there's this cleared area. She came out with her icon uh, to bless us as we we're about to leave, and, you know, like that, right? Um, um, and she was about to do it, and then she turned to her son, she says, Mojna, so she's like that. You know? And I thought, again, because I'm so smart, I said, oh, no, I'm not an atheist, right? Um, and I looked at her, and she, was, she didn't know what I said. And I said, well, I'm, I'm Orthodox, which, which I am, right? Um, um, or at least I was, I was born. Um, the son said, no, 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 he's not an old believer. That's what, that's what she means. <laughs> 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 that was her frame of reference. The second thing that happened, on that very, that very same moment, another old woman, because that's mainly what the village was made up of by then, came running out into the main square and said, uh, it was the day of the referendum, right? So she wanted to know how she's supposed to vote, right? And I said, you know, am I supposed to vote for yes or no on the referendum? But she understood it as what the agitators had done when they'd flown in to tell them how they're supposed to vote, because that's how it worked. So the agitators came in, and they said, basically, a vote this way is for Gorbachev, a vote this way is for Yeltsin. 
right? Um, and that's how she remembered it. But she couldn't remember how, what that meant if you say yes to the union or no to the union, which is the way she's supposed to vote. She's confused, so she said, so how am I supposed to vote? And I said, well, I can't tell you I'm a foreigner. Again, she looked at me, foreigner, not foreigner, you're from a city, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, uh, Mikhail Sergeyevich would like it if you voted that way, if that's what you're asking me. He says, thank you, and then she left. <laughs> <laughs> And that was my story with the Babushka, right? um, which still humbles me, by the way. Um, now, in that same year, um, this was my IREX year. Does anyone know what an IREX year is? Right. Mm -hmm. An IREX year is when we'd all automatically get uh, an IREX and or a Fulbright and, and, and serve our time in the Soviet Union, right? uh, <laughs> earn our stripes. Uh, and we do that, and it was hardship, particularly in 1991. Uh, it, it actually was hardship in certain regards. Um, uh, particularly if you didn't have hard currency, and uh, IREXs and Fulbrights in those days were in rubles, uh, so they didn't actually help us that much. Um, um, anyway, it changed the year after I was there. <coughs> and, and then suddenly these IREX students became millionaires. <laughs> so I was on the train. Uh, I was on the train, and this time I was going from Moscow up to Akhangelsk, uh, up on the White Sea. Um, and I was going to go research there, which, which I did. Um, I was fascinated by the, by the entire proposition, and sure enough, it was a fascinating city. Uh, and when I arrived there, the entire city was covered in a frost. A mist had come in from the White Sea and then froze overnight so that everything was covered with frost. Every single branch, twig, leaf, um, lamppost, everything it was a beautiful, a magical experience. But on my way up there, I took the night train, because that's what you're supposed to do. Now, in those days, and I think this is still the case, um, you generally uh, get uh, either a kupieni, which is four people, two bunks, in other words, um, or you would get an SV, which was two people. Um, so mainly because we wanted to rough it, right? We, we didn't do plexicotomy, we never thought of doing plexicotomy, which is just you lie wherever you can, right? Um, uh, in this case, I took kupieni, because that's what we did. And these involve certain rituals, um, being in the kupieni. So it's a social ritual, and it's a real one, um, uh, which I more or less understood, but I was also tired, uh, I was hungover, <laughs> um, um, I wasn't too much in the mood for socializing, but you have to do certain things. So what happens is, if you, if you all recall, um, all of you would gather around the bottom bunks with the table out, mm -hmm. and you'd put out on the table everything that you had, and you'd share it, mm -hmm. which I did. Um, and I remember in particular I had the dried figs from Greece, mm -hmm. and they thought it was very funny, you know. Fignia, right, sort of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they've never seen them. And one of the women says, it tastes just like sugar. I said, yeah, well, whatever. So, so, <laughs> so here we are, um, laying out all of our stuff. You know, it's probably going to be some warbler, it's going to be some beer, maybe a bottle of vodka, and the tea, of course, would, would come through, which the, which the, um, uh, uh, the um, she would bring out. Uh, what's your name? Right, right. Um, uh, and what do you call it if you have one pravadnik for two cars? Polu huh? pravadnik, right? <laughs> that's, that's, you got a semiconductor? Right, so, uh. no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, they're gathered around, and as usual, there's one leader in this group of four, right? So there was, I remember a young guy, you know, he may have been just out of high school, or maybe. There was an older woman, you know, middle-aged, you know, differ differential to this other man who was there, who was the guy who was actually doing all the talking, and talking too much. Uh, like, you know, it, was, it was a little embarrassing, right? But he knew everything, and he had opinions about everything. He was a little pudgy. Um, he was wearing probably check shoes, because um, that's where shoes came from in those days, and only check shoes. Um, he was wearing probably a polyester jacket or a short sleeve shirt, you know, a very recognizable type, you know, meaning mid-level bureaucracy in the Soviet Union. Um, and, but he had lots and lots of opinions. And this is a time of uh, Perestroika and Glasnost, and opinions were being expressed freely. And as we're talking, I was being more or less quiet, I was listening. My Russian was quite good in those days, um, uh, and I can carry on a conversation. And most people thought that I was from somewhere in the Soviet Union, but I wasn't Russian. And there was always a guessing game about where I was actually from. Uh, by the way, I'm from Greece. I had nothing to do with Russia, the Soviet Union, or anything like that. Um, but they didn't know this. And so as we were speaking, the guy started uh, basically streams and streams of racist and, and, and uh, ethnic uh, bigotry, right? Streams and streams. I mean, everyone was listening, and they're all into this. But he knew that I was sitting there, and he knew that I was something else, and he didn't want to offend me, because it would be impolite. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so his entire stream of, uh, of, 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 of vitriol and of bigotry had to come out carefully, because he didn't want me to be, right, 
<laughs> a lot of it was about self-hatred, about Russians. And there he had no problem, because he's pretty sure I wasn't Russian. <laughs> um, Russians are lazy, they don't know how to work, they need a strong hand, things you've heard, you know, the usual thing. Um, but then he started getting a little closer, and he started going on, he'd, he'd look at me, and I'd speak a little more, we'd talk a little more, and then he'd try to make a guess. Um, and he was saying, you know, you know, like she, you know, sort of, you know, uh, um, chest in that old, through the Lubivi, and all that, you know, sort of, sort of, you're from the Baltics, he figured out from the Baltics, right? He kept going on about how wonderful uh, Baltic people are, right? <laughs> <laughs> I remember what he said, I didn't even know what that meant. I still don't know what that means. Um, probably that they're fickle, you know, something like that. So it really went on like that. Next part of the conversation, um, suddenly, you know, he's looking at me, I'm a little dark, as they called me in the north especially, Chomninki. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that translates as what, a darky, right? Um, and so, the, so he started getting to the Georgians, um, uh, uh, culture, uh, men are real men, um, they're masculine, um, uh, they love their families, they're, they produce, you know, agricultural goods, um, and you know, no, no, that. And then you turn to me and say, "Are you Gruzin?" Yet. He goes like, "No, you're Georgian." Southerners, you know. So again, lazy and, and whatnot. Okay, so we continued. He went through a few others, but I can't remember which ones. Uh, and in each case, the same thing. You know, he begins to talk them up, talk them up, talk them up. Finds that I'm not from there, and then they become also whatever it is that they're supposed to be according to the stereotype. Uh, I remember one of the last ones was uh, Bulgarian. Uh, it says, oh, Bulgarian. So Bulgarian, you know, they're, um, what is it? You know, Drevni Narod, and so they're going on like that. Um, and by the time they got to the Bulgarians, and not Bulgarian, he says, um, uh, suddenly he says, no, Atstali Narod. Sort of like, <laughs> you know, Khastavari, uh, um, you know, anyway, so anyway. So we get to the Bulgarians, and finally just couldn't take it, and we say, Aviat Kuda. We say, yeah, Grek, he's Grecia. Ah, Drevni Narod. <laughs> <laughs> and some, I mean, this was completely random for him. He said something about, you know, Grezzi you know, Yest, which I heard from everybody, you know, which is from Chekhov, right? Um, you know, that kind of thing in bullshit. And finally, I just got fed up. And really what it was, I was hungover. Um, I wasn't in the mood for this anymore. And I admit that I violated the cardinal rule, which is you do not be rude, rude to the members of your coupé. Right? <laughs> but you just don't do that. And I did it. Right? And, I, and I think I was wrong. Right? And, and, I, and I think it was rude of me. Um, but I just couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed myself and went up, put a, a cloth over my eyes, and went to sleep. Right? He, meanwhile, is deeply humiliated. Right? And this is the part that I was, I was particularly wrong. I humiliated the guy. I just said, fuck you, went up to the top, and, uh, and went to sleep. Well, the rest of his monologue with, the, with his uh, friends there was about, um, um, uh, about the Greeks and how great the Greeks were, right? <laughs> <laughs> All of them, always. Uh, <laughs> in a louder and louder voice because the man was embarrassed and humiliated because he knew that somehow he'd insulted me, but he didn't know how exactly. He couldn't quite, I mean, he didn't know, right? So finally, he turned at one point, uh, stood up, reached up and grabbed my shoulder and he said, um, <laughs> You're not offended, comrade Greek, right? So this moment captured a number of things for me. Um, first of all, I was wrong, as I said. I was also wrong more profoundly because I assumed that because he was being um, bigoted that there was something unusual about that. Uh, but if I want bigotry, I can just stay in New York, right? <laughs> I mean, so who was I really to say, okay, you know, this guy is particularly offensive. Well, he didn't know, he doesn't have the finesse of political correctness. He doesn't know how to speak in code. So he was just being outright bigoted. And I was being particularly offended, and I didn't have the right to be. Uh, as I said, if I want racism and bigotry, why leave America, right? <laughs> um, but there's another part to it, which was he was actually looking for that personal intimacy. You know, even if he had offended me, he wasn't actually going to hate me, right? Which I found interesting. Um, and he was trying to find that intimacy, which I didn't give him, actually, which, I, which again, I regret. Um, uh, but also what I liked is he didn't know how to address me. You know, uh, I was probably one of the first foreigners he'd ever met, particularly not from the Sotstran, right, from the, from the um, socialist countries. And so uh, he didn't know how to address me. Gaspardin, that's offensive, right? He might as well just call me, you know, bourgeois or something like that. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, it's comrade Greek, right? Mm -hmm. I told my Russian friends that story, and it still stuck. You know, so when they come, hey, Tavaj Grek. 
And also I learned something about how he was looking at the world, which was everything was divided into nationalities and ethnicities, and how deeply it penetrated into his consciousness that everything is understood in national terms. That's the first and only thing you want to know about me. Um, um, and I should have learned more from that, and I should have spoken to him more about that, but I didn't. Um, uh, so he would probably be a bigot anywhere, but here he was being an ethnic bigot, right? And I should have learned more from that and actually uh, engaged him about it, uh, rather than ignore him and rather than insult him, which is what I did, and humiliate him especially, because uh, he knew he had done wrong. Shall we move on? <laughs> um, I have a friend. Uh, I've known him since around 1990, and he's a colleague, uh, but he's a friend. Uh, I mean that in the Russian sense, um, meaning he's not an acquaintance, he's not someone I work with, he's a friend. Um, uh, we went through 1991 together. He invited me to the provinces, he took care of me, he fed me when there wasn't a lot of food to go around, he made sure that I had housing, he made sure that I had warmth not only of a home, but also of his family, with three daughters whom I watched grow up. Um, and he was someone who was going through his own you know, grappling with these changes that were taking place right at that time. And he was something of a Russian patriot. Um, uh, I w he wasn't quite sure what that would mean either. Um, wasn't a xenophobe by any stretch, but he was a Russian patriot. And he, he hated to see this whole thing collapsing. And he hated to see this loss of authority. He hated to see the loss of, uh, of dignity and pride. Uh, he took a liking to me partly because I'm Orthodox. And he thought this was a connection. Um, he thought I wasn't American, uh, which is partially true, but partially untrue. Uh, but that's what he wanted to believe. And so to the extent that we're always our friends' fantasies, that was, I was the Orthodox Greek. Right. Um, and his, um, um, his thing was that you know, he was pissed off that the communists basically had, had, had betrayed uh, socialism. And so he made a transition to patriotism. And so a new government, um, he thought it would be Yeltsin to begin with, would restore dignity. You know, little did he know, right? Um, <laughs> but he thought Yeltsin would do it, and Yeltsin didn't do it. Um, over the years, by the way, he was uh, helping me with travel arrangements, helping me get into archives, um, and always inviting me, always at home. And so, as I said, drug, really. Um, and um, I still saw him in the course of the 90s. I'd go back for more research, uh, which is partly just an excuse to see a friend and, and his family. Uh, that's where we usually go on trips. Right? Um, um, and, and so, um, somewhere around 2000, must have been around 2008, maybe 2005, I made one of these trips, which was meant to be for research, but it really wasn't. Um, um, we were sitting down and drinking. Um, he was teaching me, among other things, uh, uh, I'd ask him, what's Zapoy? He said, I'll show you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zapoy is binge drinking. Right? <coughs> um, but somewhere in the course of this three days um, of Zapoy, um, <laughs> he, um, um, he said, um, you know, back when I first met you in 1990, um, you know, the KGB came to me. And they said, um, uh, you know, take care of him, but I want you to report. Uh, you're going to report about what this guy does, what he thinks, where he's going. Um, and, um, and in the beginning, I said yes, because I believed in it. Right? You know, it's, it's our country. Right? Um, but by the end of 1990, we get into 1991, I didn't believe in it anymore. So I told them no. When they came to me again, they said, what has he been doing? He said, I'm not going to tell you. That's my your chest and idea. I told them. I told them to screw off. Um, and this continued when the FSB came back in the course of the 90s and said, would you report on um, this guy? Um, by the way, it's not just me. Um, uh, meaning I don't think I'm that special. <laughs> so it, it could happen and probably does happen to all of us. Um, so um, this continued and kept saying no when the FSB would come. And then finally it got to around, uh, it must have been around 2004. <coughs> Uh, I was coming again, my visa had been processed, it had been announced, I was going to speak also, and the FSB came back, he said. And they came to me again, and they said, we report on this guy. And he stopped. He didn't continue. Right? Um, so I'm supposed to conjecture. Right? So he is reporting me to the FSB now. Um, um, and he made it clear also in a separate conversation that he actually believes in Putin. Right? He, he believes in Putin, and, and I can completely understand why. If you've been through Yeltsin, believe me, you'd believe in Putin. Right? Uh, meaning the, the loss of dignity, um, the humiliation, the national humiliation, the personal humiliation. Here's somebody who's had a career. Um, he's feeding his children. He's trying to get a house. They can't, they can't pay their, their bills. Right? Um, people doing all sorts of things just to be able to. And so Putin came along, raised the pensions, raised the wages, particularly for state workers. I can see the attraction. I wouldn't go the same route, I don't think. But then who knows? I don't know. And he was telling me, in other words, that he'd come to believe in Russia again. And the way in which he believed in Russia was this way. 
Um, and so when the FSB asked, he didn't continue, but I assume he's saying that he is reporting me to the FSB. Um, now this is less of a problem for me, it's more of a problem for you, um, which is to say that I'm actually pretty comfortable with this. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, um, report what? <laughs> about the documents I saw in the archive? Uh, about my excessive drinking? Um, <laughs> my sexual orientation? Um, I mean, what are you supposed to tell them that would bother me? Uh, I mean, report all you want. I don't care. Uh, and he's still my friend, and, and I don't mind. Um, but because we're so used to thinking, if you're an American, you're probably used to thinking in terms of you exist outside of the state, and you're in some sort of, not necessarily adversarial, but contra you exist in contradistinction to the state. You assume there's some sort of purity in our existence outside the state, and if you're in Russia, you probably believe that you exist in some sort of adversarial relationship with lust, whatever that might be. Um, and I don't accept that. I don't accept that. I was quite comfortable with this entire setup. Um, there are different ways of looking at the world, and it's a philosophical question as well. And here's where I'd invite you to, to comment. Um, um, uh, should I be uncomfortable? I mean, I, I live in the United States. Um, my email can be scrutinized by my employers at any given moment. You might not call that lust, but I do. Um, um, my, um, my emails are being stored away by the federal government every single day. How many uh, uh, electronic transmissions are being stored by the United States government every single day? About one billion. Um, 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 it's, in some ways, it's much more encompassing here. Um, I mean, the capacities of the American government. Uh, so as I said, you know, a friend of mine is writing reports to me about me to the FSB. The FSB has all this information on me, probably a thick file by now. You know, I, I think they should find better things to do, and so I, I'm, just not, I'm just not so worried about it. It doesn't bother me. Um, but you may think differently. How are we doing for time? Good. We're doing, doing good? Like Can I give you another an anecdote? Yeah, Yeah. Certainly. Would you like another anecdote? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, um, there's two of them, actually, and they're related to, to, a, similar th to a similar issue. Uh, one of them was that I was walking on the Enesky Prospect late at night. Um, uh, I was coming back from some friend's house. Uh, do you remember Leninsky Prospect? It's a very, very broad avenue. And then it has the service roads on the side. Do you remember that? So if you want to catch the bus, you go to the service road, um, and you wait for the bus there. It was a rainy, rainy night, dark and stormy night. <laughs> and and uh, I was walking toward the bus stop uh, on the service road, because it's Russia, you walk on the road, not on the sidewalk. So, so we're both walking on the side of man, a stranger. What was he, 55, 60? Um, we're both walking through the rain, dark clothing, raincoats, umbrellas, and all like, trying to make it to the, to the <coughs> bus stop. And this truck, completely out of control, comes careening through along the service road. It's clear that the route's not going to stop, so he jumped to the one side and went behind a tree. I jumped to the other side and went behind a stop sign, as if that would save me. Um, <laughs> so it was a matter of flipping the coin. Uh, the truck veered off to the right and killed the guy, right, on the spot. Um, and he's lying on the ground in the rain, and blood and brains are on the, on the road, right? Um, he's moaning, but he's basically dying, right? It was clear. And then finally the twitches, right? Um, so the man was dead. Um, so I stopped, um, and I said, well, you know, th this is momentous. In my mind, this is a serious thing, right? Um, so I went up and I took my coat off and I put it under his head, um, thinking at the same time, why on earth does this matter? The man's dead, right? What is my coat gonna do, right? Um, um, and I started flagging down cars. So the cars would stop. They'd say, what's, what's going on? I'd say, well, the man, he's dying. He said, well, would you call the ambulance? I said, yeah, so okay, and he'd leave, right? Mm -hmm. I stopped the next one, I said, the man's dying. Right? Pay attention to this, yeah, meaning it's serious. A, a, human, a human life is at stake. And they, said, they cared, and I said, but the, the taxi driver said, no, it's in a dirty my car and drove off, right? Um, I'm not gonna put him in my car. <coughs> and so this was a, mo a moment for self-reflection, uh, because it's true, the man had died. Um, now, what kind of ritual did I expect? Uh, why did I want them to uh, sort of pause and have a moment of silence for this person's passing, whom no, nobody knew anyway. It wasn't my friend, it wasn't my family. Um, so their attitude was, well, why on earth do you want some sort of, they seem to be telling me in other words, or at least that's how I internalize it, you know, why would we have some special ritual? You know, this is not a, a, a soap opera um, where the music comes on and so on like that. The man died. You call the ambulance, you did the right thing. I don't even know why you wasted your coat on the guy. He's dead, and it's true. As far as I'm concerned, um, and what is upset about most of all is that you know, on the one hand, I seem to be saying, well, it seems to cheapen human life. On the other hand, I was thinking that I'm a hypocrite uh, because I felt that I had to go through this sort of ritual and express to everybody my horror that human life had been lost. And what mattered to me most is that I had to express it, you see, uh, as opposed to necessarily feeling it. Um, 
But there was another episode with Beth, uh, Ray Fan, which is probably the most touching of all. And it went like this. I was living, uh, in that year, I was living in a Fushovka, um, uh, a five-story Soviet house. Uh, the kind of thing that we live in down here in Washington Square Village, NYU housing, <laughs> except that we're taller. And, um, um, and this will be my last one, by the way. So um, um, I was living on the ground floor. Uh, it was still Soviet times, but we managed to illegally rent a place. And uh, this was, the other person was off researching in the archive. Or he was a, the party archive or whatever, and I stayed home that day. Now, everyone in the building knew that two foreigners are living in the building, but they didn't speak to us. But they knew that we were there. It was impossible to so it was like it was probably remarkable to them. We're in one of these, you know, areas off the Indian Skipper aspect. We'd go through the first row of Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchevsky, the second row, the third row, and we're somewhere way in the back. Where it looks identical to all the other ones, but you know, you'd find your way. Um, uh, so I was staying home, and clearly they knew that I was still home. Right? And so at some point there's a knock on my door, and there's some guy who lived on the fifth floor. Um, and he asked me, he said, Can you give me a hand? We're sort of I'm, uh, um, uh, it's um, can you give me a hand? Right. He said something about his father or something. I didn't know what it was. So I walked up to the fifth floor with him, and his father was dead. Right. He had died in the night. And, um, and he said, can you help me carry the body down? Right. And I thought about it. Um, I'd actually worked uh, for an undertaker's in Greece once for a day. Um, <laughs> um, and so I was used to all of the rituals and all the medical procedures that go with death. Um, there are certain things you have to do to a body before you move it. Right. And, so, and if you don't, it's, it's messy. And um, um, so obviously we're, we weren't going to do this because he didn't have access to these kinds of facilities. Maybe they weren't standard practice. And so um, he asked me, would I help him carry the body down? And there was a friend who had a truck, and the truck would take him I don't know where, actually. Um, so I did. So I did. So the two of us um, uh, got a hold of the body and made it down the five flights, went out the front. I helped him put it in. The guy was teary. You know, he just lost his father, right? Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, someone could interpret this and say, you know, what kind of country is this where you have to carry your own bodies out? Um, on the other hand, why not? Um, I mean, why do we have to medicalize the process and professionalize the process and remove it from our own hands, depersonalize it, uh, make it into some sanitary procedure? Uh, the guy's father had just died, right? And it was a very, it was a very personal moment. I actually uh, was very, very grateful for the intimacy. Um, I was grateful that he would ask me. Um, I was grateful that he thought I would actually help him do this, and I was grateful for the experience with him, because you know, it was a profound moment for him. Um, it was profound for me simply because it was one of these moments that I miss in a country like this, but I appreciate when I'm in Russia, uh, which is a certain kind of human intimacy um, for all of our complaints. That's all. Now what do we do? Um, <laughs> if people want to just make comments or, or share, it could be kind of sixties. Thank you for your wonderful stories. It just looks as though if one spends enough time in Russia, one develops uh, a kind of uh, patient outlook on everything going around, and we can see the uh, advantages of this uh, kind of patience towards the world around you. But um, I thought about it some time ago in relation to some political challenges Russia's confronting currently. And uh, don't you think that sometimes this kind of patience typical of Russians uh, may be a problem when uh, um, action has to be taken in order to change certain realities? Yeah. Um, when you say patience, you mean understanding. Is that what I, you mean? I would say understanding, uh, patience, and also a philosophical outlook uh, on what's going on. So, I mean, why be, uh, why be against Putin if Putin is not the worst of those who could be there? Right. All right. Um, look, I, I mean, I think you're right. You know, so I, I think what you're saying, and I think you're right about this, is that um, you know I'm trying to understand the place, right? And it was alien to me completely, right? And I, I'm not from there. Um, and so I'm trying to understand it, and that requires a good dose of empathy. If not sympathy, at least empathy, right? Um, I agree, I agree. And it could easily allow me to spill over. You know, so when I was in there in Soviet times, I was trying my hardest to figure out how can this be and how can it exist, mm -hmm. to understand it. Um, did I condone it sometimes? I, I probably did, I probably did. Um, I mean, none of us thought the Soviet Union was a collapse anyway, right? 
Um, so it's possible that I'd look at its permanence and I'd look at its logic and then also embrace it. And I think I did do that. In the case of Putin, um, like the current situation, I can still understand it historically. And you know, when I look at this friend of mine, um, who is basically a Putinite through and through, um, but he took me for evenings of Cossack, uh, Cossack um, uh, song. Um, you know, and this is in northern Russia, but no Cossacks in northern Russia. And, um, uh, um, and I look at him and I can, sociologically, you know, in terms of his, his personal experience, I can completely understand how this came to pass. Can you? Yeah? I mean, you know, Yeltsin was basically, you know, they associate this with being stripped of security and stripped of, of hope and stripped of dignity, all these things at the same time. Putin came along and they felt that they were re being rebuilt. <coughs> um, the best I can do is to understand this. Now, I'm not Russia, so I'm not going to go into any opposition movements, right? Um, but if I see others who are actually, you know, strongly opposed, they'll say, okay, I do understand that, but a moment of action has come. I have to transcend <coughs> these explanations and say there's still a moral stand to be taken. I, I understand that. I do understand that. Um, always with a sense of uh, um, uh, a, little sen a little disquiet when it comes to opposition in Russia, because in Russia, I'm always looking for, say, okay, so you're going to get rid of somebody, and then? Right? Mm -hmm. And what did you have in mind? Right? You know that whole sense of the maximalism of uh, opposition in Russia, meaning destroy, 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 which I agree with. Um, but then what? Um, um, but, you know, uh, yeah. Does that, does that sort of? By all means, thank you. I'll, I'll ask a question myself. Um, <coughs> you're talking about how you're, it's true that you're not American, and it's untrue. I said partly true. Partly true. Yeah. So, so partly. Um, I, I guess I want to ask, do you think that that experience, you must be able to see things both in the Greek way and the American way and sort of see it both at the same time. Did that sort of prepare you yeah. more for, for Russia? Because I have to admit, when I first went there, it was yeah. a tremendous shock because um, like most Americans, I thought that there was just one way of seeing the world. Uh, and of course, historically, I understood that there were different times and cultures, but I really thought mm. that there was this sort of one way, uh, which seems to be kind of a fundamental American <coughs> approach to mm. things. So, so tell me, I mean, how does the, the Greek part uh, change <laughs> this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, all right, so yeah, so I, I grew up uh, what you'd call today multicultural, right? Okay. Um, so a Canadian mother and a Greek father, mm -hmm. right? And they had it out, right, pretty often. Mm -hmm. um, in those terms, right, mm -hmm. you know, Trudeau is the greatest leader, meaning the father, not this mm -hmm. one, right? So mm -hmm. Trudeau is the greatest leader, and I'm tired of hearing about Trudeau, we have a real struggle here, we have military dictatorship, and they're like, ah, like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my job was to stay out of it and to appreciate both sides, right? <laughs> so, a survival mechanism. So, um, um, but, I, but I think, you know, aside from the fact that one was Greek and one was Canadian, right, with a, with a good admixture of American also, um, to me it was, you know, at some point you also get released from the particulars and you begin to try to understand things um, in, in a cosmopolitan way. Mm -hmm. Cosmopolitan is a good word, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you try to understand, you know, you, Give it the benefit of the doubt. Try to understand what. Uh, so, so when this guy came <coughs> to me and said, "Can you help me carry my dead father down the stairs?" Um, I didn't take it as, "Are you kidding me? Get away from me!" So, what's disgusting? So, no, 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 not at all. It was like you know, this is a really, really human moment, and that I'd recognize from Greece, right? Mm. Or, I'm sitting on uh, Nieski Prospekt. This drunk guy comes up to me um, and asks for for a cigarette, right? And well, that's a moment of real socialization, right? And that's when we sat and we talked, right? At that mm. moment, we had the cigarette together. Uh, he was a real, you know, Sovietsky chelidic, right? So he put it out, put it behind his ear, right? Um, and drunk, walked right into the middle of Nieski Prasper, you know, and um, got hit, but not fatally. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so they're, they're, those are human moments, right? And so I, 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 I see that less than like here, right? mm. I, I, that kind of, you know, inter that sense of intimacy. The bigot on the train. Uh, you know, he was actually trying to be human with me. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a bigot. Um, uh, but he was trying to be human with me. He was trying to have a direct interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and, it was, and it was meant to be a warm interaction. And, and I appreciate that. And mm -hmm. that, I, that I get from growing up in Greece. Right? Mm -hmm. um, does, does that sort of... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sort of the sense of the human interaction being 
something worthwhile in and of itself rather than uh, kind of incentivized or yeah. No, so, I mean, how would you translate abshent? How, how, how would you? Which? Abshent. Oh, just How would you translate that? Socialize. I mean, so we just move from real contact to sociology, you know, you see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> see what I mean? Yeah. Gotcha, do you know what I mean? I, I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, excuse me, Professor, I have a language question. When you traveled uh, to Archangel School, being in Petersburg, did someone correct your mistakes in Russian? And if yes, how? Well, <laughs> um, for the most part, no. For the most part, no. So some of them who are my friends would do it because they cared, right? Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they'd always say, oh, you speak fantastic Russian, which wasn't true. But um, <laughs> they're just impressed that any foreigner would bother to learn Russian, right? So and this was, it really impressed them. Right. Um, but for the most part, they didn't correct us. Um, um, uh, but over the years, because I went less frequently, and you know, I had to stay here, and I had to, you know, administration and teaching, and children, the full catastrophe, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so and, and, and I just lost practice, right? So when I go back uh, to this one place in particular where they'd seen me over the years, I remember two comments they made. One of them was that my Russian's getting terrible, and it'd become an embarrassment, because any of his friends, because friends can say that, right? Um, and the other one was, um, even Greeks get old. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, that was particularly good. <laughs> mm. well, thanks so much for this. Um, this is really great. And I like it because it sounds like each of these stories, especially the babushka and the sewing machine, makes it sound like it made you like a believer in the ethnographic method. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more as specifically or broadly as like about how this, these experiences maybe collectively or specifically change the kinds of questions that you're asking or the way you're approaching your research methodolo methodologically. Yeah, so, the, so this one was, is, well, there's something ethnographic about what I'm talking about, um, which there is, um, and how did it change, how did you know, these kinds of sensitivities, how did they change the way that I, that I think and the questions that I ask, and the answer is completely, absolutely. Um, and the first thing I, I, I learned about is to be careful about the questions that I asked. Um, because it's the old problem, you know, by going to <coughs> Babushka and asking her about collectivization, I'm loading the question and I'm giving her the answer. I'm going to ask her to conform to this. So had I been a different, a different mentality, I would say, you know, you're ignorant, you don't know what you experienced yourself, right? Uh, but she wasn't ignorant, she was well aware, but of something else, right? Um, so uh, I'm always careful, but in my writing and in my speech, or just, you know, always be careful. Uh, what kind of question I ask and try as much as possible to, to formulate the question out of what I've already been told, right? And to see where that takes me. At the same time, bearing in mind the other part, which is that I also have a moral compass, right? Uh, um, so I do believe that, you know, bigotry is bigotry, misogyny is misogyny, you know, so, you know, and that's, I'm kind of absolute about that. But I can still study it and try to understand where it's coming from, how it's formed, so yeah. Does that sort of? Yeah. You know, yes. The question I have is that probably that person has never left the Soviet Union, and so the only way that he categorizes the world are the stereotypes that he's heard. So we all categorize, we just have had the blessings of being able to travel both places and be around to not become, not realize the bigotry that is if given in the categorization that, uh, that we naturally do psychologically. So, you know, he never got out of there, so how would he know the world any other way? Well, on the other hand, you know, he met, you know, um, Babushka had never met a foreigner, but um, all these other people had met, you know, East Germans, Czechs, Hungarians, uh, Tatars, uh, Georgians, you know, so it was supposed to be, I mean, they would never use the word, but it was supposed to be a real mix of people, you know, coming together of peoples, right? It's supposed to allow, no? If you want to put it that way, you can, but, you know, it's not like they hadn't seen otherness, all right? I mean, it was all around them. Moscow, do you remember what Moscow used to look like? Uh, it was a real mix, you know, it was a real, um, uh, before it became white. Um, um, so, it's not so much do they have differences and do they see differences, but how do they organize their differences? And, and in the Soviet Union, I think the truth is that they organize them in terms of almost primordial, um, um, essential characteristics, you know? 
uh, you know, the, what would I get all the time? You know, oh, he's Greek, he's temperamental, or sort of like that, because they thought they knew Southerners, right? Um, or others, you know, oh, you know, that person, you always have to accept their gifts because then you get very, very angry and it's immortal, so, you know, so just things that are, you know, stereotypes, you know, extrapolation, but it's essential qualities. And that, that's what I thought was remarkable about the Soviet Union, uh, the essentialization. Um, uh, so it's, so they, they saw a difference. So what was the Bulgarian one? <laughs> socialist, the socialist country, oh, right? Yeah. So it's supposed to be somewhat familiar to them, right? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for this human moment. But I, I kind of want you to reflect on one idea of mine that maybe these human moments happen to us when we're in foreign countries, when we see ourselves and others in a different angle because I came in opposite direction, you know, for 1988. I came here and the amount of my human moments here is enormous. Okay. Which, when I'm looking back to Russia, I, I know that I had them too there, but I start seeing them very differently when I start traveling, mm -hmm. when I first time crossed the Soviet Union border in uh, 89. That's in a funny way my human moment starts. And maybe your human moment, which you feel that much, it's not very Russian specific. Yeah. Yeah. It's a specific of different relationships. Could be. It could be. I have my human moments when I go home, though. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, How often do you go to, back to Greece? I was there last summer. Um, um, a particularly human moment, because the country is basically being fleeced, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, I get, I get a lot there. I'm not saying that, I'm not, I'm not saying that you know, Americans are inhuman. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's, a different, it's a different way of... You know, and I'm not even saying that my human moments were only in America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Many other countries, too. No, no, I, I, I'm very fond of America. <laughs> my children are American. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate your comments about bigotry just because when I was an undergrad in Russia studying, um, there were also a lot of Nigerian students yes. in my city, and uh, I, I became friends with them, you know, they spoke English, so that was a little comforting to me, but also because they were black, and I was comfortable with that being an American, and uh, our view of bigotry as an American and as a Nigerian were totally different, and whereas I was appalled that they'd be stopped on the street. Uh, to get a picture taken or someone would want to touch their hair. They weren't at all. They understood. Yeah. Uh, these Russians sometimes had never seen Africans for whatever reason. And uh, it was it was a learning moment for me to understand that, you know, it's not necessarily racism or, you know, appalling, I guess. Um, we, we organized a session once. It was about uh, Africans in the Soviet Union. Right, and so a lot of these people came out of the woodworks who had studied at Lumumba University, Kharkov Technical University and all that, and they were at NYU now in different places, and they all came together because it was nostalgic for them. So all the speakers were tended from, they were Americans, they were uh, Europeans and all that, and all of them were very, being very you know, forceful about this, that you know, there was racism in the Soviet Union, and you know, this is unacceptable, and how good of it, and the, Af the African students who had gone to university, they said, well, of course the Soviet Union is racist, but what's new about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was, you know, and they, and they were saying things like, you know, yeah, of course they treated us like, they called us monkeys, you know? um, but when we were told you know, not to dance with the Russian girls at the dance, or the Ukrainian girls at the dance, uh, the KGB came in and closed them down, right? and there were consequences. Now there are no consequences. Hmm. There were Greeks in the former Soviet bloc. I mean, I had some colleagues. Uh, the, after the Civil War, the, lo the losing side was set. I mean, I had some colleagues in the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. and they were settled in former Sudeten uh, villages. And what was amazing is, of course, they looked Greek. They had Greek names, but they were entirely stripped of their culture. They didn't know language, they didn't know anything. I mean, 100% Czech, because once they settled them, the message of the Secret Police was, okay, you're safe, but you have to become 100% Czech. You become Czech, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, there are these, so after the Greek Civil War, there were all these refugees who were settled in places like Tashkent. Mm -hmm. Every time I speak to someone from Tashkent, they say, oh, we had Greeks as neighbors. Everyone seems to have their Greek neighbors in Tashkent. Um, <laughs> and so, but because of Greek citizenship laws, all of them have the right to return to Greece. So after the fall of the dictatorship, all of them exercise this right. And there's this wave of them coming back and more or less assimilated. The ones who were never assimilated were the Pontic Greeks, um, who also have the right to return. 
return. They've never been to Greece, but, um, <laughs> right. um, and, but they speak with a different accent, uh, and they, um, uh, I can't communicate with a Ponte Greek, right? but they learn modern Greek now. But you know, Ponte Greeks are also the Chukchi of Greece. Right? So all the jokes are about Ponte Greeks. Right? Uh, that was a more difficult position. Mm. Can I ask you, uh, you spoke about the maximalism of uh, Russian, mm -hmm. whatever, liberal. I wasn't talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I was. I mean, the way that you understood, do you think that you could, were able to understand your friend precisely because Russia is a point, is a uh, thing that you do research in and the, your research interest and not the interest of your life, uh, so to speak? And for Russian liberals, it's quite the opposite. Because right. this uh, kind of um, attitude uh, wasn't it the same as when I remember when Putin was, when Brezhnev, or Brezhnev, or mm -hmm. when Yeltsin was being elected, and he was secretary of Coma, the secretary of the party committee. And people said, yeah, but of course everybody was secretary, everybody was communist. Mm -hmm. That's OK. And the same uh, was repeated when uh, Putin came to power. And people who elected him, who voted for him in Russia, would say, "Yes, he's a KGB guy, but who wasn't a KGB? Guy? But but look, he speaks German. He at least he looks, he knows one foreign language." And we know what came out of this, of this kind of understanding. Do, do you think that for you, I understand completely the way that you could understand him, but do you think that Russians, uh, that it's a useful effort? To do what? For the Russians, to understand their leaders, let's say, or people inside Russia as having, I don't know, this kind of preferences and not to fight it. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I do, I do think so. Yeah? I do think so. Meaning, how you know go about changing something simply by fighting it, but not necessarily understanding where it's coming from and how you can reshape it. So, for example, let's say that a new liberal movement comes up in Russia, a, a viable one. Um, in opposition to Putin or Putin's successors or the oligarchs, who knows what. Let's say, um, and there to once again call for the complete destruction of you know centralized authority. Let everything go free. Let the market take over again. Right? Um, can you imagine what the consequences would be? They would kill liberalism in Russia for the next 300 years. Right? It seems to me. Um, but if you understand that you know, for instance, if you want, you believe in a liberal society. Um, what's wrong with actually raising pensions? You know, what's wrong with actually having a, a, some sort of welfare protections? What's wrong with giving people some security, not only in the streets, but with, you know, economically, and also so they can feed their children and put them in schools? That's not incompatible with liberalism. So the smart liberal and the smart oppositionists nowadays will say, okay, we disagree with this particular kind of authoritarianism. We call for certain kinds of decentralization and plural plural plurality in politics, but why do we have to throw out all the provisions that are meant to, meant to you know, raise the, the bottom of, of society? That takes some sort of empathy. You know, understanding why even this guy, this lumpen proletarian in the street, who votes, you know, for, for Putin because he's angry about something, um, even he needs to be understood. Don't you think? Well, well unfortunately, we're going to have to stop, though. <laughs> Last question. Have yeah. you ever celebrated the Victory Day on May 9th? Yes, I have. Yeah. Did they see veterans? Yes. Did you talk to them? Yes. What's your impression? Of the veterans? Yes. Well, they're pissed off, right? What is it? Yeah, what the ones it? I spoke to, but I have no scientific sample, but the ones I spoke to were pissed off. What yeah, sort of, you know, proud of what they did, uh, but a certain sense of, you know, we fought, and then, you know, look at the privileges we lost also. We're no longer first in line everywhere, you know, that kind of thing. Pensions, uh, pensions were cut by inflation first and foremost. Um, uh, uh, and also the sense that you know, we fought for a great country, and where is it now? Right? So what do you think they would think of Putin? Those ones I spoke to. Don't you think? I have completely different experience. Okay. Uh, so round of applause.